Welcome everybody to my talk. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, enhancing data processing in browsers using streams for the front-end track. A uh, shot about me, my name is Konstantin. Um, I'm a performance engineer at Backend now for two years. And um, I made my Master of Science here in Hamburg and been working professionally for six years now. So, and what I want to show you today is um, Streams API which has been standardized by the Whitwig organization. And um, what it actually does is it finds a new standard for um, reading data. So um, you can get chunks of data transformed from the internet to your machine, then also writing data. So you can send data chunks from your browser uh, to a server or um, yeah, any other device. And in between also piping data so you can receive data and on the fly transform the data to another chunk format. So um, this concept, of course, uh, hasn't been invented by the Whitwick organization itself. So uh, um, you may know the concept of input and output streams in Java, for example. Or if you do PHP, you know um, the fopen, fwrite, and so on commands to use and to open files and transform them. If you do Python, you know the I.O. module and knew the um, text I.O. operations and so on. And if you're a JavaScript developer and uh, are using Node.js on the server side, then you're knowing the stream class maybe, and you have definitely used um, the FS module for file transforming where you can have uh, readable and writable streams. So and now this is coming to your browser and um, the basic functionality already landed in the evergreen browsers you know and you love to use. So uh, um, what can we do now with this new API that we have? So um, for instance, as we have now the possibility to work with separate chunks, um, we can do some kind of real-time data processing, actually. So um, instead of, you know, you have to download the whole document, you can have an endless document which is downloaded chunk by chunk and can be transformed. You could also realize um, edge site includes, which you maybe know from Varnish or Nginx. You could do this now in the browser just by um, getting the HTML on the fly and transform it and include um, other chunks of HTML and fetch them and then combine the streams. And also, you can now imagine any kind of uh, data processing with image, video, or audio data. So you can do like video analysis and effects. This is also a use case which the Streams API says uh, that they designed the API to use for by themselves. And um, also you can imagine using decompression and, decom uh, and decryption, like you can uh, get data and uh, have some kind of um, uh, AES encryption on the data, and then you can decrypt the data on the fly, chunk by chunk. So um, let's get used to it. So, uh, Imagine we have um, some kind of data stream here, and on the left side, we have some kind of arbitrary underlying source of data. So this can be anything. This can, for example, be um, a server which sends data to the browser, or an open web socket, or something like this. And now we want to offer our browser an interface for this. So we want to have some kind of reader on the right side, um, which can consume this data. And therefore, the Streams API provides a feature called um, the readable stream. So uh, what are the properties of this readable stream? Um, it is natively integrated now into the browser API, um, if you use the fetch API. Maybe I can just get, a f um, could you raise your hand if you have used the fetch API before? Uh, it's not that kind of easy to see you. <laughs> uh, but it's quite a few, right? So. Um, if you use the fetch API before and you've been working with the response object, you can create a readable stream right now with this fetch API. Um, also, what's kind of cool, it's a promise-based interface, so it's quite modern. Um, if you have been uh, using the fetch API, for example, or other modern APIs in the browser, you are getting used to more using promises instead of callbacks, and um, this API uses them too. 
Also, um, when you use them, you have a, mutu uh, a mutually exclusive reader. So um, you cannot have two positions or two instances in your browser which are consuming the same readable stream. So if you have one, um, one download which is actively running or one fetch, and then you're working on it, you are the only reader who can consume this um, the stream. And another cool feature of it is you can actually T streams, which means like, okay, you have one data stream, but then you can make two out of it. And so you can then actually have um, two instances which are consuming the stream for uh, different purposes. For example, you maybe um, have a download and you want to send the other, uh, the, the, uh, the first, data stream to the browser to get rendered and maybe for the other um, for the other stream you want to go this one into the browser cache or the service worker cache for example and then you can use it later on but this is then done in parallel and while downloading the um, the data object which you are currently downloading so this is quite fast okay so we had the code talks so we want to see some code um, how does this look like if we are uh, if you see the readable stream so um, if we have the fetch API, then you make it used to this, or you are used actually to the syntax. Um, at first, we are, um, we are downloading or we are requesting some kind of URL. Um, the async await, um, I have another question. Who of you knows the async await syntax? So I guess it's also quite a lot. So maybe those guys who also know fetch and promise have been, uh, have been using this as well. So actually what this await command means is the function is paused um, when you request the fetch from the browser and when the download is done, or not actually when the download is done, but when, when um, the first HTTP headers have been arrived, actually the function is continued to, um, to work and then you get the response object and can um, handle it. So, and um, when we are at this moment, actually, when, when the HTTP headers have been downloaded, you can then get a readable stream um, from the body, which is then in the next line, and then you can get a reader, and in this situation, you lock the stream now for you to read, and um, then you do, you see this while true loop, so you can now uh, consume the data uh, and um, consume every chunk. Maybe you have seen the syntax. This is actually, uh, um, it comes actually from iterators. So uh, you always ask if I'm done, if I'm done, there's no, uh, no data chunk coming and we have downloaded the full object. Otherwise, um, there's a new data chunk which you can then consume or can do anything with it. Like, okay, I'm just in this example, I'll just lock it out. And um, in the end, you can release the lock and then you're done and you have consumed the stream. So um, this value object here is actually a byte array. So um, it's binary data which you can consume and if you know typed arrays, you can do um, bit operations on it. So you can really get 16-bit um, 16, 16 integers, unsigned integers, 32 bits and so on. So you can really get fine-grained data out of this data stream which is quite nice if you're uh, working with binary formats. And we'll also show this later on in the demonstration. Okay, so can we have this even nicer? Yes, we can. So uh, it's a new year, so we have a new ECMAScript specification. And um, there's now the async iterator concept. And if you now look at it, this uh, looks much shorter. Uh, and the magic here actually does, again, the await keyword. But now it's here um, at the for loop. So um, every time, um, we want to have a new data chunk. This is, sorry, I forgot to say it here. So we have to wait again for the next data chunk to arrive in our browser. And um, we can have this here more in a serialized way in the for loop than um, that this for loop actually only continues to um, iterate to the next step when um, the next data chunk is available and will automatically stop and release the log if it's done. Um, so now you maybe guess uh, I was quite cheating here because uh, you see there's an stream async iterator function and um, I don't want to be shy, I will show it to you. It looks like this. <laughs> so uh, there's again the while loop. Um, so we cannot get really rid of it right now. Um, this, the folks at the streams API, they're working on it to, to support the async iterator concept on their own. 
But I guess if you just use this function once, or you define it once and use it everywhere in your code, then you can just simply use the for wait loop, which is quite nice, and then you can um, have a stream processing of your data. So, um, okay, now we have seen that you can um, get, yeah, you can get the data from the fetch API streamed, but what if I have my own uh, data stream, which I want to, um, which I want to offer to other users that they can stream it? There's actually um, the possibility to use a constructor of the readable stream, and then you can um, pass these methods to it, which allow you to um, control the way that the readable stream can be consumed. So this is kind of an event-based um, interface. So the start method here is executed when um, the consumer starts to consume your stream. Then there's this pull method. So um, there are two ways the readable stream can be consumed. It's push and pull based. So um, imagine in the download, if it has been started, um, all the data is sent by the server and you cannot really control it. But you can also um, have another model with um, the, the consumer being able to control the, the download or, or um, the data that is being sent to it. So it can say like, okay, stop, please. I have too many data. Um, I have too much data. Please, please stop here. And then you can just actively say, okay, pull. And I want to have more data if you're again ready to consume it. And um, which is also quite nice is the cancel method. So when you're consuming the data, you can always actively say like, okay, I have an error and I cannot continue. So please, um, please abort and don't send me any more data. And you can react to it by using this cancel method here. Okay, so um, how do I apply this really? Um, so you create the rebel stream with new um, and then you can create your own async function here. You can enqueue into this controller um, any data chunk which you want to be consumed by, um, by the consumer of this readable stream which you create. So uh, this chunk here can be any kind of data that you want to be consumed. So you can create a readable stream of strings, of numbers, of um, also then um, binary data. And if you do it with binary data, for example, so with the U and 8 array um, especially, then you can uh, also use this readable stream to uh, do an upload with the Fetch API, which I will um, show later on too. So um, in the end, you call close, then you tell the consumer, okay, I'm done, I've sent all my chunks, and then you're finished. And if yourself have an error, you can also uh, not get errors from the consumer, but you can also send errors to the consumer, which is quite nice. So you have here a forward propagation too, and then you can tell the consumer, oh, sorry, uh, my underlying source is broken and I uh, cannot send you more kinds of data, please abort. And then you send this error message to the consumer and it can then act on it and uh, gets informed. Okay, so this is also quite nice, but uh, let's look now at the browser support. And um, actually it's not that bad, but uh, what is a big issue here is that Firefox um, only supports this quite now with flags. And um, this is quite bad because you cannot really use them there at all. But the other browsers now uh, have them included and also in quite uh, stable versions. The Edge and the newest version actually, or the, the second newest version but uh, um, Chrome and Opera do offer them for quite a time now. Um, but what now if um, a browser doesn't support it, what should you do? Actually, you will find polyfills out there in the wild, but I wouldn't recommend you to use them because uh, the really benefit from streams is that they are running natively in your browser, so they are very fast. So um, I would always tell you to rather feature test if um, streams are available. And you can easily do this by just saying if response.body and then you can ask, okay, is response body available? Then I can use it. And uh, then you can do the streamed consumption of the body and otherwise you just await for the whole body to be downloaded, which is um, unfortunate, but you can still do the same processing, but you have to use the whole data. Okay, so this is about reading. So now let's look at writing. So um, again, we have some kind of data stream here and we have some kind of data sync now on the right hand side, which we don't know quite what it is. It's a file upload or um, maybe uh, a WebSocket, which we are streaming to. 
And um, now we want to offer our browser a writer interface. And therefore, you, I, <laughs> I guess you knew, is the writable stream. So uh, what is the properties of a writable stream? Um, it's not really natively integrated yet. So uh, you always have to create it on your own. It also has a promise-based interface, so uh, they're quite aligned to each other. Um, and also, like with the readable stream, um, you have a mutually exclusive write on it. So only you can write to it, so um, there's no mix-up with data and you don't, get, um, you don't have the problem that some kind of other object may write to your writable stream as well, because you are locked to be the only one who can write to it. So um, how do you create your own writable stream then? And again, you have um, the start, um, start event there. So no surprise. Um, it's called when you create the stream and when somebody uh, starts writing to you. Then uh, you can react on every chunk which is written to your writable stream. So this method actually is called with the chunk data. And um, as you can see, I put the type any for it because it really can be literally any data which you receive. So you have to pay attention there that the user um, may send you strings, but you expect some kind of different data. So you uh, maybe have to do a type check first and then transform the data to, um, to the type you expect or send maybe a, a, an exception or something like that if it's not the, the, the right data that you expect. And um, if, um, if the user says, OK, I've sent all the data I want to send to you as my writable stream, then you get the close event. So you, you can then say, OK, I, I, rece I received all the data. And then um, I finished the upload, or I closed the, writable, um, I, I closed the web socket, or something like this. And in the end, um, there's also um, this kind of forward propagation with errors again. So um, if the user aborts sending you more data chunks, you are getting informed with this abort method and then you can um, get a reason and say, okay, I know that the user stopped consuming or stopped producing chunks for me and um, then I can react to it and tell also the server, okay, something terrible happened here on the client side and um, I cannot continue. So let's look at an example, and now um, it's with WebSockets. So uh, maybe you know the WebSocket interface, which is quite old. It doesn't use promises, unfortunately. So here in um, the start event of the writable stream, we are opening the WebSocket, but we have to uh, create our own promise here, which is resolved as soon as the socket is opened. And then uh, when the user sends data chunks, we can send them to the socket now. Um, this is just the native uh, WebSocket send API, which we are now wrapping with our write method. Um, what I want you to pay attention to here is uh, actually the uh, WebSocket API is synchronous and not asynchronous. So uh, we cannot know when actually the data has been sent um, in full. So unfortunately, we cannot control here uh, to to don't receive the next data chunk as soon as the WebSocket is really finished writing. Because otherwise, you could also make this function asynchronous and return a promise. And the next data chunk would only be um, sent to the WebSocket then if uh, this write method has been finished doing this. And um, in the end, if the user is finished with closing, then you can also uh, return a promise again. So um, the write stream is definitely first closed when the WebSocket has been closed successfully, which is also done here with the onClose event of the WebSocket. And this 1000 here just is a status code which tells the browser, OK, we have successfully uh, produced our data to the server, and we just want to um, close the writable stream gracefully. Now, um, OK, how can we now use this writable stream, actually? So um, what's the interface there? And that's quite nice because there's just a simple pipe to method. And um, if you now, in this example, we're just downloading some JSON uh, from, from, I don't know, a local server. And um, if you have now the response body, you can get this readable stream and pipe it to a writable stream. So in this example, actually the data we download is every time we receive a new chunk being downloaded, we actually do now upload it chunk by chunk in our WebSocket. 
So this is quite nice if you have very large files and uh, you cannot wait for, I don't know, four gigabyte of data to be downloaded and then upload everything again. You can get small TCP chunks of it and upload every chunk when it comes to your browser. Okay, so again, let's now look at the browser support for this. Um, so now we are uh, getting to some terrain which is not that quite good. So Firefox hasn't implemented at all now and uh, Safari hasn't unfortunately too. But Edge now with the second use version also supports it. So uh, you can there use writable streams in um, yeah, the full advantage. Okay, so let's now uh, look at my personal favorite. If you now have um, not a simple data stream, but you have like one kind of data coming in on the left hand side, and you want to output some kind of different data, which is, I don't know, like, okay, in this kind of thing, it's just a recolor gem, but uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, I imagine I have strings, but encoded in UTF-8, and on the right hand side, I want to have real strings, so I can perform JavaScript string operations on it. Um, then you do have something like a writable stream on the left hand side for um, the UTF-8 encoded strings, and you have a readable stream on the other side then for the strings, uh, objects themselves, and um, then you have some kind of transformer in the middle, which is now um, transforming the data from the one format to the other, and therefore the Streams API offers you a transform stream. So what are the properties of the transform stream? Uh, they are actually being natively integrated and uh, they're coming with the next Chrome versions. And uh, um, this allows you to pipe actually readable streams. I will show you how this looks like in a bit. And um, you can also use them, which is quite nice, to create a pair of readable and writable streams. And what's the use case there for? Uh, I will show you just um, on the next slides. But first, let me um, show you how you create your own transform stream. Again, you have the start method, so it's the same as with the other streams. Then you have a transform. And this event is actually called when any kind of data chunk comes through your transform stream, then you can process it and um, you can enqueue into this controller the transformed data and pass on the next data chunk which you want to um, result in with your transform stream. And in the end, um, when uh, when flush is called, so you have rec received all the data chunks which, um, uh, which should be transformed, then you should um, ensure that you have also uh, enqueued all the transformed chunks there. So as soon as the asynchronous, the promise which you return with the flush has been fulfilled, actually you have, no, uh, you have not the possibility to enqueue any more data or to access the streams which are underlying this transform stream. So um, you have to ensure there that you're really finished and you have stopped transforming any kind of data. Which I also want to show you here is um, you have not the possibility to react on any kind of errors. So um, if, you're, if you have the problem uh, like, okay, you cannot transform the data, you can tell this controller to forward propagate the error, um, but you cannot react yourself on any kind of errors which occur. Your transform stream just doesn't know and doesn't get informed. Okay, so I told you, you can create your own readable and writable stream pairs. Um, this looks actually like this, and you can use it for file uploads. So if you create a transform stream, this is an identity transform stream, which doesn't transform the data, so just the same data type which gets in just gets out on the right-hand side. And then you create a writable and a readable stream pair. So when you're writing to this uh, writable stream, you can consume the data on this readable stream. This is quite nice because in the fetch API um, you can um, put a readable stream object actually to the body property. So um, if you're now uploading data, you can use this readable stream to have data which is then, um, which is then consumed by your browser while sending chunks to um, your server, for example. So and then if you want to write data, you then get the writer on your writable stream and you can just, for example, pass here a U and 8 array with some kind of yeah, binary data. So in, this kind, uh, so in this example, these are just some um, ASCII characters. 
And if you're done sending all the chunks, you just call close. And then the file upload will also be closed because um, the transform stream links this writable to this readable stream. And so um, everything just gets informed. And what is quite nice here is that all these methods here are synchronous. So um, you don't have the hassle of just thinking, OK, uh, is the next data chunk sent? Do I know it already? You can just tell the stream, OK, I have this chunk, 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 just take it. And please do the upload as soon as you can. And when it's finished, um, you, uh, yeah, you don't have to um, think about it by yourself. The browser takes, um, takes care for you about this. Um, you can also use the transform stream when you really are transforming data and not using the identity stream to um, pipe data through it with this pipe through method. So in this example, uh, we are taking the binary data stream we get and we are, uh, you know, this is a byte array, so there are many um, bytes in it. And we take actually every kind of data chunk now and make a stream of single bytes out of it. So you can look at every byte when you're consuming it. So in this case, we're just piping through this transform stream which we created. And um, this byte stream here is then a readable stream again, which um, then if you consume it, has each byte as a number value instead of being a U and 8 array, which is not that easy to consume. OK, now let's again look at the browser support here. Um, so this is top notch. <laughs> and uh, only the newest Chrome version actually supports it. So, um, and Opera, of course, as well, because they're aligned. And um, you can use it in the stable Chrome version today, but uh, you really shouldn't rely too much on this feature uh, because, you know, it won't work in the most browsers. Okay, but now for an Outlook, what you will uh, be able to do with it, um, uh, coming to Chrome 71 and Opera 58 is actually the text decoder stream API for the native integration. So um, you can there say, uh, I have strings encoded as UTF-8, for example. And if you have this transform stream, you can then get, uh, if you have a stream of text data which you download, which can be CSS, HTML, for example, or JSON, then you can simply um, pass the um, these text decoder stream to the readable stream. And then the data will get be uh, processed from the U and 8 arrays directly to strings. And then you can work with string data, which is uh, much easier and makes more fun. So uh, stop with the code. I guess you want to see how this works or that it does work. So um, I have an example for um, the target image format, which is, uh, which is quite simple. But uh, it's not supported in any browser today. So we want to polyfill actually the target image by um, simply transforming the download to a PNG file. So we have some kind of hosted target images. And then we are putting a service worker in between, which you have to imagine like um, a proxy in the browser, which can get the data uh, from the server and transform it on the fly. And we are doing the stream. So uh, um, every time a new data chunk is downloaded of the target image, it's actually transformed into then a finally a PNG file, which can be rendered by all browsers. So uh, I want to show this demonstration. Just uh, if you want to get the code for yourself, then you can take a look um, at my GitHub repository and um, check it out. And I will then shortly show you uh, how this actually looks like. So. OK, so. Uh, so this is my example. Uh, as you can see, you can see that the target image is not supported yet. <laughs> uh, by, I don't know if you can see it. it's here on the left-hand side. And this is why, because um, I disabled the service worker here. So if I now uncheck bypass for network and then um, start or load the page again, then you can see there's now um, this cappuccino image. Um, now being transformed from the target image format to the PNG on the fly. And you can see that it really works streamed with every data chunk from the target image, which gets processed um, and is being converted to PNG, is encoded, is sent to the browser, and gets rendered. So um, of course, I want to show the code as well. 
So this looks like this. If you are uh, familiar with service workers, you may know those event listeners here. With install and activate, this is just some boilerplate um, service worker code, which you use to get it started earlier. And then there's this fetch event. And every time your browser wants to receive some data, you can hook into here and do some operations with it. So and what we are now doing is we get the request object here, which is the same um, as from the fetch API. And then we can um, handle any kind of target request, which we are checking here. And then um, we're now doing the actual streaming. So uh, we fetch the target image, um, which we want to transform. Then we get the readable stream of it. Then we create a transform stream, which um, actually does the actual transforming. Then we pipe our target um, data through this transform stream and get a PNG stream. And then we send this PNG stream in the end to the browser so it can render it. So um, for the interesting part, uh, how does the target to PNG transformer look like? And now you can see that there's um, the interface I've shown you on the slides. So you have um, the start, transform, and flush methods, uh, which I told you before. And um, what we do here is actually, um, while starting, um, we are starting an asynchronous conversion process. So um, this done converting is actually a promise, which is resolved after all the target image data has been transformed and the PNG data has been created, which is then sent to the browser. So, and, um, so here in this first part, we don't have any data yet. So um, we simply just say, okay, I now start the process and maybe create the, um, the uh, PNG file magic, which starts in the end, so I can already send the first bytes of data. And um, in the end, so no, then I receive every um, chunk of uh, target image data here in the transform method. I enqueue it to this um, chunk queue, which is actually just some kind of uh, buffer for all the chunks which get downloaded. So um, if the download of the target image is faster than my transforming, I can um, store them in this queue and then process them um, every time I'm, I'm ready to get the next data chunk. And in the end, um, there's this flush method. So uh, the browser tells me, okay, I've downloaded the target image fully and now please stop the conversion process. And so I'm now awaiting for um, the done converting. So I'm, I'm sure that the conversion process has been finished. Okay, so um, how does the conversion um, look like by itself? Uh, so it's quite straightforward here. You have some kind of a target image consumer on the one side and you have a PNG producer on the other side. So they both combined are the transforming process. Um, at first you get uh, the width and the height of the target image from the target image header. And then you just write out the same data um, as the PNG header done, for example, to get um, to, to, uh, to tell the browser, okay, what are the image properties? And what then happens is that simply the whole uh, target data, which is um, BGR, so blue, green, red encoded, uh, gets transformed to uh, PNG data, which is red, green, blue encoded. So you have to uh, actually um, send it around. And also PNG data is um, deflate encoded. So you have, uh, have also to do a deflate encoding. And in the end, there's also a PNG end chunk, which you have to provide. And after that, you're really done um, writing the stream. Okay, so uh, the data conversion itself looks quite complicated because you have here an asynchronous um, encoding of the data chunks in, uh, with the deflate processor. Uh, but here down, if you look at this, you just see, okay, I iterate through every image row and then just transform every, um, every pixel byte by byte. So yeah, and this is quite nice, so now um, maybe you, you think, okay, this um, was actually quite slow. So um, the problem here is uh, this image is much larger as it looks here in the browser. And I just uh, took an extra large image. Uh, so this has uh, over 70 megabytes. And um, just to show you um, that it's actually streamed because otherwise if it's just a small image with uh, a couple of kilobytes, so this is really like just there. Um, but now with uh, 
a lot of larger data chunks, you can see really that every process chunk is being rendered. And yeah, so this is the way it works. And yeah, I guess it's quite nice. So um, uh, coming back to the slides. Um, um, so I'm from backend, and what do we now really do with it? So um, as I told you before, you can also use it for uh, text encoded resources. And uh, actually what we do is we speed up your website. <laughs> and um, what is quite essential with it is that you um, get data transformed or get data passed through the browser as soon as possible so the browser can render it as, um, uh, as early as possible. So um, what we do, for example, is um, we take the first HTML chunk and put additional properties to it. And um, if you have the first HTML chunk, then we can include into the HTML header uh, lots of new headers or even some inline CSS, which the browser can already render. Uh, in a service worker, for example, and then the rest can just be um, downloaded synchronously and we don't care anymore. But because the first chunk of the HTML, which contains the essential data uh, for the browser for the most properties, um, we can there uh, already tell the browser, okay, what to use with the data or what to do with the, uh, what to do with the HTML and what to render. And um, so you see earlier that the page is loaded. And even with um, the target image example, which I showed you, if you really have, for example, the WebP image format or so, and you polyfill it with the Streams API, you see because it is streamed, you get earlier um, the user to see the image unless uh, he would have to wait until the whole target image has been downloaded, then do the conversion process, and then uh, the browser can um, just display the data first. So um, with being streamed, he can render every kind of the, uh, every chunk he already received, and this is quite faster. And the user, uh, for the user perceived performance, it's better, so he can see earlier um, which which image is going to be there. So uh, I also want to pay your attention to uh, our other talks. So um, I'm just the first of uh, three more upcoming talks, um, and also just if you stay here in the cinema. We will hear uh, Felix talking about service workers, so the technology I just used before explained uh, bit by bit. And uh, also I'm giving another talk in, um, in Cinema 7, so uh, if you like animations, I will hope uh, you enjoy that too. And um, in uh, the, our last talk is going to be at 3 p.m. Uh, from Wolle, and he's going to talk about real-time architectures with um, uh, Storm, Sansa, Spark, and Flink. Yeah, so um, that was it for me. Um, this was my first code talks, and this was also my first uh, talk at a larger conference. So uh, please, if you please vote for me and uh, give me an honest feedback, it would be very nice of you. And yeah, thanks for watching, and I'm look, uh, I'm glad for hearing your questions. Yeah. Where do, uh, where do you work? Uh, actually, on the codetalks.de website. Okay, there's, if you scroll to the button, so you go to the talk and scroll to the button, there's a uh, uh, leave a review button, and there you can write a review with stars and so on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Maybe you have to wave a bit if somebody is, uh, wants to ask something because I cannot see properly. Okay. If, if there are no questions, then uh, yeah, thanks again. And yeah, um, uh, yeah, see you soon or see you at uh, Cinema 7 at 2 p.m. <laughs>